Good morning. It's so good to be with you this morning. It's great to see so many faces. We have uh, been short the last few weeks for uh, many reasons, uh, mostly due to, to sickness. It's good to have Brother Bill and Sister Penny back with us. Good to have the Greens, uh, except for Melissa. She's still not feeling well, but good to have uh, most of the Greens back. Good to have the, the college kids all back with us. It's good to have the Flowers family uh, back after their uh, quick travels to, to Texas. It's good to have visitors with us. It's good to have the Randolphs, also uh, Dalton. Very happy to, uh, to have you all with us this morning. Very thankful that my mom and dad uh, can be here. Uh, they've been able to, to visit for a couple of days. It's so great to be able to, to come together to worship God together. And I pray that God has been glor glorified and will continue to be glorified by the time that we spend together this morning. So for those of you that are visiting, uh, some would tell you I should probably apologize uh, because I am not uh, the evangelist of the Jerry Whitson Road Church of Christ. This is a uh, fifth Sunday, and on the fifth Sundays of the month, uh, we allow men of the congregation to speak. So hopefully you were able to listen to the radio program this morning and feel that comforting voice of Brother Jesse. There's an article in Authentic Theology, and I'll just say I don't know how authentic it is. But it says, Churches of Christ nearly alone in Christianity and prohibiting women. So the article says, The vast majority of churches of Christ completely prohibit women from speaking and leading in their worship services and from teaching men and boys over the age of 10 in Sunday school. The churches of Christ are nearly alone in Christianity and completely prohibiting women and girls this way. Some denominations do not ordain women as senior pastors or priests, but they generally do not completely prohibit women from reading scripture, leading singing, teaching Sunday school, and similar roles, and from preaching in some cases. Many evangelical denominations, Assemblies of God, Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, Church of God, Church of the Nazarene, and nearly all mainline denominations, Methodist, ordain female pastors. Hardly any denomination in Christianity completely bans women from speaking and serving up front like the Churches of Christ does. It is common in Islam to completely prohibit women from speaking and leading in this worship service, but it is not uniformly done in Islam. A recent study found that having only male congregational leaders causes long-term harm to many of the young girls in the congregation. And I looked at that study, and I'm happy to, to share that with you if you would like to read. Um, it's, uh, it's mostly trash, just to be honest with you. But reading that... Uh, it, it saddens me that obviously we are perceived that way, that we are perceived as a group of people that downplay women, that downplay the role of women. And I think that, you know, uh, too much emphasis is often given to the limitations that are placed on women in the assemblies. And I think uh, some of that is because what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 through 37, where it says, The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or a spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. Or what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 11 and 12, a woman must quietly receive instruction and with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. So when I read an article such as that, I'll be honest with you, it, it really saddens me. And when I read articles like that, and I think about a woman's role in the church, I can't help but think about my granny. And over the last week, for sure, I've been thinking more about my granny. I had a great aunt that passed away a week ago today. She was the last of my granny's siblings, the last of ten. She was the last of that great generation. And I think about the influence that my granny had on me, the great example that she was of a godly woman, the great work that I was able to witness her taking part in throughout my life. But I also think about my daughters. I think about how they're being raised, the things that they're being told by society, 
And you may think, well, Jason, aren't you the one raising them? Yep. And it's scary. And I, as I was preparing, I think about the fact that Elise turns 8 today and Zoe turns 13 tomorrow and literally it seems like yesterday that this all started. And so I feel a grave responsibility in making sure that my daughters understand the great importance that they are to the church. The great influence that they can have on those that are around them. You know when Norm P., I guess it was on Wednesday night, he asked me, he'll be preaching this evening, he said, well, what are you preaching on? I said, I'm preaching on women. And when I say that, when I said it to him, and as I tell you, although I might be preaching to, to women, I'm not preaching just for the women. Because we all have grandmothers. We all have mothers. Some of us have sisters. Some of us have wives, and some of you that don't have wives, Lord willing, one day we'll have wives. So this is very important, I believe, to all of us. And as I was thinking about our study through Acts in the early church, and then downstairs in the college class, we're now beginning a study in Romans, and I, and I think about Romans chapter 16, and actually this was one of the things, or one of the passages that I was going to, to have read, and then uh, I felt bad because there's a, a lot of names in Romans chapter 16. And uh, unfortunately, in uh, our Bible class last quarter, uh, I called on Carly to read a passage that uh, I hadn't thought too much about beforehand. There's a lot of rough names, so I didn't want to put that on Jude this morning. Proverbs 31, I think, is a very good passage when we're talking about a worthy woman, and we'll talk about that a little bit more a little bit later. But when you read Romans chapter 16, and Paul is expressing his thankfulness and his love for this, this group of people, there's a lot of individuals that are mentioned. And I didn't go through and count, but I'm pretty sure at least half, if not more, than half of the people in Romans chapter 16 are women. In verses 1 and 2, he talks about the service of Phoebe, who was a helper of Paul and many others. We know from our study in Acts about Priscilla. And it said there in Romans chapter 16 that they, she even risked her life for Paul. In verse 6 of chapter 16, there's one named Mary who it says worked hard for the church at Rome. In verse 7, it's Paul's kinsman, a Junius, who was well known among the apostles. In verse 12, it, it talks about Tryphena and Tryphosa, workers in the Lord. Also in, in verse 12, Persis who worked hard in the Lord. And we'll look at some of these uh, examples that we read about in the early church. But I think about all of these women. I think about my granny. And I think, did they feel like they weren't important? Did they feel like they couldn't participate in the, in the work of the, the church or, or participate in, in being an, a great influence on those that were around about them? No. Absolutely not. And I think about us as a congregation, too. Obviously, we are without elders. We're striving to... To, to, to be to that point one day. But we put a lot of emphasis on that, and we have men's meetings. We have young men's leadership class. We do all of these things for the young men. And I want to make sure that the women understand, both young and old, that each and every one of you are important. Each and every one of you, you are an influence. And you can be a worker for the Lord so when we read about these different people that Paul mentions here in Romans chapter 16, how can it be that, that if women are limited in the public assemblies, then how are they able to do all this work? Well, public assemblies are actually a very small part of the overall work of a congregation. Very small part, or it should be. You know, there's so much work outside the assembly that must be done in order for a church to grow as the Lord intends it to. And women are often able to provide much of this needed work. You know, I had read somewhere that we learned from this that Christian women as well as men labored in the ministry of the word. In those times of simplicity, all persons, whether men or women, 
who had received the knowledge of the truth, believed it to be their duty to propagate it to the uttermost of their power. So what can a woman do? How can she contribute to the growth and success of a local church? Well, a woman can and a woman should have great influence in the growth and strength of the church. And I want to look at three ways that her influence can make a difference this morning. First, I want us to see that a woman's work and influence in evangelism. This is something that obviously we've put uh, a great amount of focus on this quarter with uh, Jesse's uh, Bible class on personal evangelism. And I feel quite certain, I've not been able to participate in the class except for the first one, but I p- feel pretty certain Jesse is not uh, directing that to the men. You know, in Matthew chapter 28, we read of what we commonly refer to as the Great Commission given by the Lord to His church. Go therefore and make disciples of all saints, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You know, we've just finished talking about uh, Romans a couple of weeks ago, and I mentioned we're studying it downstairs in the college class, but when we were going through, we, we put a lot of emphasis on Romans 1, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This is a work that can and should be done by everyone. You know, women can do so much in the area of evangelism. Turn over to Luke chapter 8. You know, women can help support those who preach the gospel. Over in Luke chapter 8, we'll begin in verse 1. It says, Soon afterwards he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses, Mary, who was also called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. The support that they were giving to the preaching of the gospel. You know, as we were studying through the book of Acts, we read about Lydia providing much needed hospitality. This is in chapter 16 and verse 15. Turn over to John chapter 4. You know, we, we recall the story of the Samaritan woman and how instrumental she really was in converting many people to Christ. In John chapter 4, we'll begin in verse 28. It says, So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Skipping down now to verse 39. It says, From that city many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. But see, in the beginning, it was because of her. She wasn't going to hold this in after she realized who the Christ was. You know, we mentioned Priscilla, who, of course, with her husband Aquila, played such a great part in Paul's ministry. You know, whenever we were studying through the book of Acts uh, downstairs with a high school class, one of the things that, that really, uh, I guess, was drawn to my attention is I think we give so much emphasis to Paul that we forget all of these other people. Maybe not entirely forget, but it's Paul's missionary journeys. Well, guess what? Paul didn't go on a single one by himself. There was such a huge part uh, that other people played in helping him, and Priscilla and Aquila were two of those people. Turn over to Acts chapter 18. You know, we know that they provided a place for Paul to stay during his ministry at Corinth. We see that in the beginning of Acts chapter 18. And this is after they had left Rome uh, because of Claudius and the command that had uh, been given for the Jews to leave Rome. But then we read in the latter part 
of uh, Acts chapter 18 about Priscilla playing a part in the conversion of Apollos. In the beginning of verse 24 of Acts 18, it says, Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the Scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Priscilla didn't, didn't say, you know what? Aquila, maybe you should handle this. I'm just a woman. It very clearly tells us Priscilla and Aquila, they took him aside. We know about Priscilla hosting a church at Ephesus in her home in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 19. We know of them hosting a church at Rome in their home in Romans chapter 16 verses 3 through 5. Think about all the great good that Priscilla did, the great influence that she was, not just on Paul, but so many in the early church. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. You know, a lot of times when we think about our influence, I think we, we focus on the words that we say, uh, the, the encouragement that we can give in, in that way toward people. But our example is such a huge thing. And I think about my granny, and I think about she's not someone that went around and, and was, was very loud-spoken. Uh, she was a very meek and a very humble lady. But wow, did her example speak volumes. 1 Peter chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1, it says, In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won, how? Without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Even without a word, godly women can lead others to Christ, including their unbelieving husbands. Women can be so valuable, so influential, in the work of evangelism. Many souls have been saved. Churches have been started through the evangelistic efforts of godly women. But what about a woman's work and influence and edification? You know, edification is an essential work. It involves the building up of the body of Christ to the work of every member. We talked about that this morning in our Bible class with Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 15 and 16. Again, it, it doesn't just pull out the men and their responsibility and, and, and their work and their influence. In verse 15 of Ephesians 4, it says, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him, who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies. Again, that's not just men. According to the proper working of each individual part. Again, that's not just men. Causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You know, this edification, it involves such instructions as bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ, as we read in Galatians 6, verse 2. From 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11, Therefore encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. Also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14, Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. That's not just to men. Actually, to be honest with you, women oftentimes can do that better than the men. Women can do so much to edify the church. They can do it through formal teaching. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Whenever I first started, some of you were probably already thinking about this example. As you think about great women that we read about in the New Testament... But women can do so much to edify the church through formal teaching of others. Grandmothers, mothers, obviously can teach their children just as Lois and Eunice did. Timothy, beginning in verse 5 of 2 Timothy 1, it says, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. You know, I, I read that, and I put myself in the, in, in the place of Timothy, and I think if Paul was writing to me,
Jason, for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Virgie and your mother Kathy. And I am sure that it is in you as well. Grandmothers and mothers play such a huge role in the influence and in the life of their children and their grandchildren. 2 Timothy chapter 3 now. In verse 14 it says, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He knew them from childhood because of his grandmother and because of his mother and the great influence that they had on him. Turn over to Titus chapter 2. You know, eventually, those of you that are younger, Lord willing, even my daughters, although they are my daughters now, one day they're going to be mothers. And again, Lord willing, they're going to be grandmothers. And it will be their responsibility to teach those that are younger. In Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, it says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Again, the older women play such a huge part in the teaching and in the edification of the younger women, but also of all that are in the church. You know, especially where there are people who come into the church without the benefit of godly mothers and and godly grandmothers, and we have those. This is an opportunity for Christian women to be ultimately like a surrogate mother, surrogate grandmother to these Christians. But not only can women edify through the formal teaching of others, but through informal words of encouragement. They can be so edifying to the church. You know, it's been said that men are natural producers and women are natural nurturers. They have that innate ability to to nurture. You know, with so many dysfunctional families and emotional problems today, the gift of encouragement and the nurturing possessed by many women is so essential to the church. You know, many teachers, many preachers have been helped by godly women, encouraging them in their work. I'm sure that we can talk to any preacher. We could ask Jesse about the women that played such an important part of getting him to where he is today. There's a special need for women to see themselves as teachers of young people and other women and as encouragers of men in their work of preaching the gospel. You know, when one looks at how the the local church is organized, what it is called to do and worship, and the purpose of the gifts that Christ gave his church, I believe it is fair to say that edification is such a huge part of that work. The spiritual development of its members And that's not just given to men. Women can and should play a huge role in that. And where women are involved in the the work of edification, their contribution to the work of the local church, it really shouldn't go unnoticed. We should be thankful for the work that all the women are doing. Finally, let's take a look at a woman's work and influence in Benevolence. So when we talk about benevolence, the disposition to do good, goodwill, kindness, charitableness, the love of mankind accompanied with a desire to promote their happiness, an act of kindness, good done, charity given. As we know, benevolence is such an important part and work of the church that sometimes takes a back seat with the emphasis that we put on evangelism and edification. But we can look at very many passages in the New Testament that help us understand the importance of benevolence. James 1.27, the mark of pure and undefiled religion. 
ministering to the sick, the poor, the imprisoned. You know, that is a service that is rendered to the Lord himself. As we looked at that passage recently in Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 through 40, where it says there in verse 40, The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. You know, the early church, uh, again, something that, that impresses me every time that I, look, I, I study through the book of Acts is the way that the saints, the early Christians, ministered to one another, how they cared for one another, how they loved one another. In Acts chapter 4, we see the church at Jerusalem caring for its own. We see also in Acts chapter 11, the church at Antioch caring for the brethren in Judea. You know, we have many passages that talk about the churches of Macedonia and Achaia participating in the work to help the uh, Christians in Jerusalem. All Christians, again, not just men, are to be involved in this work. Women are well suited for benevolence. No, that is not a sexist comment. Women are well suited for benevolence. Just look at me. And then look at any of the women. Women, they bring a grace. They bring a beauty which men can't bring. Even if I shaved my beard, I'm not bringing that grace and beauty. You know, the unique attributes of women, it really does lend themselves to this work. You know, as we talked about the nurturing nature of women, mercy, compassion, it's almost second nature to the nature of, of women. They possess the skill through which benevolence can so easily be rendered. Turn over to Acts chapter 9. Again, so many of these great examples we read about in the early church, in the book of Acts. And we think about all of the various things that women can be a part of, whether it's cooking, ministering to the sick, extending hospitality, making clothes as Dorcas did for the needy widows. And I will say this, yes, I said cooking, I said ministering to the sick. Men, you should be able to do these things too. That's not just a woman's responsibility, but women are oftentimes very good at this. So in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 36, it says, Now in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it happened at that time that she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. Since little was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him, Do not delay in coming to us. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room, and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. What a great tribute to Dorcas and all the great work that she had done and how thankful these people were for her. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 5. You know, my prayer is that no one, none of the ladies here have to experience what it is like losing a, a spouse and becoming a widow. But the truth is, that does happen. And women who might later be taken into the number, they were to be known or well reported for good works. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 9. A widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, having a reputation for good works. And if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work. You know, any work that a woman does in the area of benevolence is a powerful contribution to the work and to the reputation of the local church. If 
You know, it's been said that a good example is the best sermon. And after my granny passed away, I had given an invitation. That was before we changed to five-minute invitations, so it was like a mini-sermon. But the title of it was, The Greatest Preacher I've Ever Known. And it was about my granny. Proof of my granny's preaching is right here in that picture. Proof of her influence, proof of her work as a godly woman is right here in this picture. So this picture was taken at my granny's 80th birthday party, and my granny is the one right here in the middle. In this picture are 67 of the 69 members of our family. We had a couple of uh, husbands of cousins that were not present. And of the 69, 68 of those that were uh, of age were Christians. Jude read for us Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. I'm just going to read verses 28 through 31 again. It says, Her children rise up and bless her, her husband also. And he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. You know, I mentioned how sobering it is to me to be in the situation of, of raising daughters, and you see how quickly it can happen. Zoe is the youngest at that point. She's not even one year old. You know, it's one thing to read about such a great example of love and faith, but it's another to see it lived out. And yes, I do love my granny dearly, and I will always praise her. And I know that all of us have those ladies that have been such a great influence on us in our lives. You know, her faith to God never wavered. Even until the end, her willingness to thank God and to count her blessings. It's humbling. So we read about these various letters that Paul wrote to the churches, and we read about all of these, these beautiful ladies and the great things that they did in the early church. And it should really encourage us to recognize the great responsibility that women have. And it should also help us to be more appreciative of the women and the work that they do in the church. As we close, I want to read a, a portion of a letter that my Aunt Mildred actually wrote to my granny. This is just before she died. And I'm thankful that it was made available to, to all of us. People don't write letters anymore. But just hearing what my Aunt Mildred said about my granny, her sister, I think helps to give credence, really, to, to what I'm telling you, not that you wouldn't believe me. But she says... Since I am not there to help out, I thought I would just write a few words about how wonderful you are. I started to write a tribute to you for your 80th birthday, then, and thought her children and grandchildren can write, giving Virgie more honor than I ever could. Virgie, you don't only deserve honor from your children and grandchildren, but let me as a sister, both by blood and in Christ, praise you. I feel a little weak and lowly compared to you. You so truly fit the virtuous woman spoken of in Proverbs 31. You are most definitely given to hospitality, Romans 12, 13, 1 Peter 4, 9. We cannot count the stars in the sky. Neither can anyone count the people you have served around your kitchen table. Or the meals you have taken to the sick and those in need. 
you and Bernice took his niece and nephew in to live with you. The nephew was there a long time. You treated him as your own, not counting your own children and grandchildren. You have many times have made the bed for company to sleep, some you barely knew. You can't count that either because you have done it so many times. I've not forgot you letting my two grandchildren spend time with you so they could get started in Huntington School before they all got moved up from Texas. One of your grandson's girlfriends lived with you for a while before they got married. We have stayed with you more times than I can count. We always enjoyed being with you. There have probably been others that I never knew about. You are due praise. You know, there is certainly much that a woman can and should, should contribute to the local church. And I hope that each one of you recognize your value. And I want you to know that I appreciate you. And I'm sorry if I have not made that known enough. You know, the true measure of a local church is not defined only by what occurs in the assembly, but it includes what members do day by day in the home, at work, as we're out in the world. It involves what evangelism, what edification, and what benevolence takes place on a daily and personal basis. You know, when godly women are active in the service of the Lord, using the unique talents that God has blessed them with and the opportunities that God has blessed them with, the truth is souls are saved. Souls are strengthened in the Lord and souls are cared for. The Lord's church is made stronger and the kingdom of God grows. So I hope that there will always be a surplus of women in the Lord's church like my granny, like Priscilla, like Mary, like Trophina and Trophosa, Persis, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, Lydia, the Samaritan woman, Lois, Eunice, Dorcas, and of course Phoebe. Romans chapter 16, verse 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church which is at Sincrea, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many, and of myself as well. May we never take for granted, nor denigrate the valuable service that is rendered by our sisters in Christ. May we always receive and encourage them in a way that is worthy of the saints. You know, God has set forth his list of essential activities to be saved. I know that after the, the shutdown of, of 2020 and we, we talked about, well, well, this is not an essential work, so you don't need to be doing it. Well, God, again, has set forth his list of essential things that you need to do those activities that are essential to your spiritual life, your spiritual well-being, and ultimately your eternal life and your eternal well-being. You know, God has done his part. Now it's up to you. If you are not a Christian, you must hear the gospel of Christ. Romans 10, 17. You must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 8, verse 24. You must repent. You must turn from your past sins. Acts 2, 38. You must be willing to confess publicly that you do believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior, the Son of God. Romans 10, 8 through 10. And you must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Mark 16, 16. And as we talked about this morning in Bible class, yes, you must remain faithful. You must continue to serve God faithfully throughout your life. Have you made the decision to be a disciple of Christ? If not, why not? If not, make that decision this morning. Have you followed Christ and sinned? Ask for forgiveness. Repent of those things today. If we can help you in your service to God in any way, please come forward as we stand and sing the song that's been selected.